The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Let's join in singing the first and the fifth stanzas of Hallelujah, Jesus Saves. seated. Very early on that morning, the women went to the tomb. When they got there, they found that the stone, which was very large and which had sealed the tomb, had been rolled away. And they asked, full of terror and amazement, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus. That's the question that we asked on Maundy Thursday. And we answered, he's in the upper room. It's the question that we asked Good Friday. And we answered, he's on the cross. He's nailed to the cross. Early In the morning on that first day of the week, there was a young man there at the tomb. And he answered that question by saying, he's not here. He's been raised. And though they ran from the tomb with terror and amazement, saying nothing to anyone, it said, the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. You see, at the very center of the Christian faith, of our Christian faith, is the outrageous claim that Jesus Christ is risen. He who was dead is risen. And that's why we're all here today, isn't it? On the third day, he rose again. And yet, though the resurrection is the central thing, the central event of our faith. I think a lot of us, maybe most of us, really struggle with it. Perhaps more so than we struggle with the cross itself. For at least we can explain that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Right? But what about 
the resurrection. You see, it was not his crucifixion that launched this movement called Christianity, but rather it was his resurrection. And if that's true, and it is, what does that mean? What does the resurrection mean for our lives today? This morning, I want to share with you two images to help us to at least begin to answer the question, what is it all about? The first is a story. It's a story about two friends visiting an art museum. Think about the Met or something like that in New York, perhaps. I was there a couple of weeks ago and did much the same as these two friends going from picture to picture and reading what it's about and taking it in. Well, they got to this picture, which, was, which showed two people playing a game of chess. One was an ordinary-looking man playing chess. The other kind of had a devilish look or appearance to him. And he had a smirk on his face. The ordinary looking guy is down to his last two pieces on the chessboard. The title of the painting? Checkmate. Meaning that for that man, the game was as good as over. The situation in that game, at least for him, was hopeless. Well, one of these two friends who were at the art museum was looking at the picture and, and and got totally engrossed in it. Now, his, his friend, the other guy, got kind of bored and impatient. And so the, the one said, you go on, you go ahead, I'm going to stay here. There's, there's something about this picture, I just, I just got to look at it more. And so he stayed right there at that picture, and he looked at it, and he studied it, and he pondered it. There was just something about that picture that captured at least his attention. After a long time, his friend came back, saw the rest of the museum the way I go through museums. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've been there. I've done the Louvre in Paris in 10 minutes. No, some people spend 10 years doing the Louvre in Paris. His friend came back, and he's still studying the picture, and he says, what's going on? I mean, why are you still here? He says, there's something about this picture. I got to go find the artist if he's still alive because there's something wrong. Either he has to fix his painting or he has to change the title because the king still has another move. And if he makes that move, he'll win. The king has another move. And that's one of the meanings this morning that I want to share with you that Easter is all about. The king of kings has another move. And you know what? It's a winning move. And it's consistent with the rest of the biblical story. Think with me. Remember when Moses and the Hebrew slaves, remember the story of Moses and the Hebrew slaves? They're running away from the Egyptian army and they come to a point where the Red Sea is on one side of them and the Egyptian army bearing down upon them is on the other side. It looks hopeless. But then they discover that the king had yet another move. And the waters opened up. Or do you remember the story of a young teenager by the name of David? He went out into battle against this giant of a warrior named Goliath. And Goliath (laughs) and his cronies, the Philistines, were laughing and they were shouting, Checkmate! But David knew something they didn't know. The king still had another move. And then there was a time when another young man by the name of Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. The lions were hungry and Daniel was defenseless. The emperor Darius said, checkmate. But the lion's mouths were shut tight and they just laid down. And why? Because the king still had another move. And on Good Friday, 
They tried Jesus. They judged him. They whipped him and they beat him. They mocked him and they scorned him. They hung him on the cross and they put his dead body in the tomb. And everybody said, it's over. It's done. It's time to go home. Checkmate. But they were wrong. And why? Because the king still had another move. And when God makes that move, love wins. Hope wins. Light overcomes darkness. Courage overcomes fear. And faith overcomes despair. And you and I are born into a living hope. The promise of Easter. The promise is to you and to me that no matter what you and I face, whether it's the pain from the past or the fear of the future or perhaps struggles with the reality of your life today, whether it's physical pain or a troubled relationship or a trying circumstance, when life seems to say to you, checkmate, don't forget The king always has another move. But I need to share another image too. Because the winning move image, as true as it is, is often difficult for for me to fully digest, to fully embrace. Because sometimes, most of the time... Life isn't quite that rosy for me. (laughs) As true as it is. Because the king always has another move. So this other image comes from author and scholar N.T. Wright, who makes a powerful case, at least powerful case for me, that Easter, Jesus' resurrection, is about God's future and about God's new creation breaking into the here and now. And he uses the image of all the time zones that we have around the globe. I'll try to personalize his image. Many of you know that our son Jacob has been spending this year in the Philippines. There's a 13 or 14 hour time difference, depending if we're on standard time or daylight savings time. So last night, when it was still Holy Saturday here, and we were still observing the stillness of crucifixion and the darkness of death. While it was Holy Saturday here, over there, it was already Easter Sunday. They were already saying, Christ is risen. The new day had already begun. Now imagine that Jacob had called us or in this day and age, Skyped us in the middle of the night and had woken us up saying, Christ is risen. It would be as if a bit of the future was breaking into our life today in the here and now. It's still dark here and now, but a bit of the new day is here as well. I know, Becky, you were telling me the same thing. I told you I was going to talk about it. Your son, David, overseas, uh, wearing a uniform on behalf of our country. Same thing. Same thing. A bit of the future breaks into today. That's kind of like the resurrection. you got to think this through with me. That's kind of like the resurrection. We didn't get a phone call or a Skype but rather a visit from someone, from Jesus, who was already living in the new time. He is already in the new day of resurrection life and the new creation, and he's come back to the old time to tell us, to tell you and me, that the new day, The new day that God has promised from of old. We heard John read it in Isaiah. That the new day has in fact already dawned. And 
that even though we may feel heavy with weariness, and I sometimes do, and even though it may seem to be dreary still, and sometimes it does seem that way, and maybe when it even seems a bit, a bit dangerous out there in our world, and sometimes it is, that the new day, in fact, has already begun, and you and I had better wake up and get busy. That's resurrection life today. N.T. Wright's point is this, and I'm going to read a quote now. If God's new creation has already begun, parenthetically I want to add, and it has, if God's new creation has already begun, those of us who have been wakened up in the middle of the night are put to work to make more bits of new creation happen within the world as it still is. Let me read that again. I think it's important. If God's new creation has already begun, those of us who have been wakened up in the middle of the night are put to work to make more bits of new creation happen within the world as it still is. Our job is to follow Jesus, the firstborn of the new creation, and to work to bring more of that new creation into the lives of people around us and into the world in which we live. As we experience the hope of the resurrection, as we experience the next move of the king when it appeared that it was all over, we are then to discern how God is working in the here and the now to make the new creation, to make the kingdom a reality on earth as it is in heaven, as we will pray in just a few moments. We're to join in that effort. That's our job as resurrection people, to join in the effort. What's that mean? In the new creation promised by God, there will be no hunger and no sickness. So you and I as resurrection people are to work to abolish sickness and hunger in the here and now. In the new creation, swords, it says, will be beaten into plowshares and war will be no more. So you and I as a resurrection people are to work for peace and the end to all wars and hostilities now. In the new creation, peace and justice shall reign for all. So in the here and now, as people of the resurrection, we are to work for peace and justice for all. In the new creation, people from all tribes and all nations will be gathered together and welcomed at the table. So as resurrection people, you and I are to work to break down the walls that divide one from the other. Resurrection. It's about God's new creation breaking into the here and now through Jesus and through Jesus' people. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so when you're down and out and it seems that there's no hope for you, remember, the king has another move. Christ is risen. He is risen. God's future has broken into today. A new day indeed has dawned. And it's time to get moving. It's time to start living as people of the day and as people of the resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And say amen.